Hey there, it's Shannon Mapchick Myers, and today we'll be checking out the Pigeonhole Principle. This is created from the EP text, and I'm happy to have you joining me. The Pigeonhole Principle states that if N pigeons fly into M pigeonholes, and if N is greater than M, then at least one of those pigeonholes must contain two or more pigeons. So if you just kind of look at the visual here, um, just let's just say that first pigeon decides to go in pigeonhole three, the second one goes in pigeonhole one, the third one goes in pigeonhole two, this fourth pigeon is going to have to share with somebody else, right? So what do we see about this? If we're thinking about functions from like your college algebra classes and stuff, um, you're thinking about a function that is not one-to-one, -one, right? So it's a function because the each pigeon goes to only one pigeonhole, but it's not one-to-one -one because two pigeons are sharing the same pigeonhole. So anyway, um, this of course represents the set of the pigeons, if you want to get kind of a visual on it. And then this over here is the set of the pigeonholes. All right, so now looking at the pigeonhole principle, a function from one finite set to a smaller finite set, like we just had before, cannot be one to one. So it sounds very simple, but it's very powerful. There must be at least two elements in the domain that have the same image in the co-domain. Sorry about the doggies. So let's look at the proof of this. First off, let's restate this in more of a mathematical format. So for any function f, from a finite set x and x had good n elements to a finite set y and Y, remember, had M elements. If N is greater than M, then F is not one-to-one. -one. Now we are going to be using the following, um, a set is called finite if and only if, so the IFF is short for if and only if, it is the empty set or there's a one-to-one -one correspondence from 
set one, two, three, dot, 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 down to N. to it where n is an element of the positive integers. In the first case, so the case of the empty set, the number of elements in the set would be what? Beautiful, zero. That's also referred to as cardinality. And in the second case, it is n because there were n elements. All right, so we'll be using that. So for, for this one, the proof is actually gonna be starting down here. So let's suppose f is any function from a finite set x within elements, just like we had up there, and the function is mapping it to a finite set y with M elements, where N is greater than M. Now, if we let Y1, Y2, all the way down to Y sub M denote the elements of Y, set y, now for each of these yi elements that belong to the set y, the inverse image set F inverse at YI is equal to some X such that, or sorry, some, some X that belongs to the set X such that F at X is equal to yi. So that's just looking at inverses, right? So the elements of the inverse image set, or set, sorry, for all the elements of y are f inverse at y1 comma f inverse at y2 
all the way down to F inverse at Y M. Each element of X is mapped to some element of Y. The set Y. That's by, just so you know, definition of function. So, thus, each element of X has to be an element of one of the inverse image sets. So if you think about it, therefore, the union of all these sets, all these inverse sets, equals X, the set X. Now, since X is a function, what do we know? We know that none of the elements of X can be sent to more than one element of Y. All right, so each X goes to only one Y. But you could have different elements in the set of X going to the same Y. So, since each X, or since X is a function, we'll say none of the elements of X can be mapped or sent to more than one element of Y. So what does that tell us? It tells us that each element of X is an only one of the inverse image sets and so the inverse image sets are mutually disjoint So we have this first equation, we'll just name it star, n of x is the number of elements in, in set x. That's going to equal to the sum 
of each of the elements that are in these inverse sets. all the way down to N of F inverse at YM. This is by the probability addition rule, right? Because we have the disjoint sets. All right, so now suppose We'll be joining up these these uh, this equation with something else momentarily. Suppose f it is one to one. So we're we're going at this about in a contradiction proof by contradiction. Now that we've done the setup, well, if f were one to one, what would happen? Then each set f inverse at y i. has at most one element because the assumption is that f is one to one so therefore f inverse would have at most one element at each of the yi's so the second equation the number of elements in F inverse of Y1 plus the number of, of elements in F inverse at Y2 plus dot 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 plus the number of elements in F inverse at YM is gonna have to be what? It'll have to be less than or equal to, because we said at most one element, right? So less than or equal to one plus one plus dot, 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 plus one, because we have those M sets, right? M terms. This would be M terms, and that in turn equals M, correct? Now, what else do we know? We know that N is equal to the number of elements in the set X. And from that last one, we're saying has to be less than or equal to M. which is equal to the number of elements in the set Y. So where did all this come from? N of X was given to be N, right? That was part of our, our premise, okay? But N of X, we said, was also equal to the sum of the number of elements in each of these inverse image functions, in inverse image sets rather, right? So basically, remember that N of X is also equal to all of this, right? Which we said was less than or equal to M. But what do we know about M? It was given in the premise that M was equal to the number of elements in Y. But what happens? This contradicts the part of the premise that N is greater than M. Therefore, 
F is not one to one, and that's what we wanted to show. So we're done. Cool, cool, huh? All right. So now let's let's look at how we would use this. And so first example, if 20 cards are drawn from a standard 52 card deck, must at least two be of the same denomination? So if you're not familiar with a playing deck or a card deck, it's got four suits, diamonds, hearts, spades, and clubs, and it's got um, denominations that go from two to an ace. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king, ace. So there are 13 denomination cards. And this question is asking, hey, if 20 cards are drawn from a standard 52 card deck, must at least two be of the same denomination? So let's check it out. So if we think of, let's just denote each card as C sub I, right? So the pigeons are the cards, right? So these are the pigeons. And so in the, this, so if we have card one, card two, card three, card four, card five, card six, seven, card eight, card nine, card 10, card 11, card 12, card 13, all the way down to card 20. So this here is our set for the pigeons, right? And our function, each one of these is going to go to a certain denomination, right? So I could just call it function. So each card goes to a pigeonhole of a denomination. So the pigeonholes would be the denomination And we had said that there were 13 of them. Start, if we start with 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll name these. It was 10, Jack, Queen, King, Ace. Those are all the denomination sets. So if we took a look, Let's just say, you know, we are going through and let's just say card one was denomination three, card two might have been denomination two, this one maybe could be an ace, and you just kind of go through. And it is true that one of these could have been picked um, already, you know, and it doesn't mean that you're going to have to go this many times, but here, if you just kind of see, I'm, I'm mapping each of these to a separate denomination, and there's no particular order in this. And then on our 13th card, right, you have to, the on the 13th, you know, you have to start going to something else, right? Because it's going to have to repeat. So once you draw 13 cards, at least one of them is going to have to repeat. So say that you have your C14 here. C14 is, is even if the first 13 by some miracle went to a different denomination, that 14th card would have to repeat, let's just say it was also an ace. And so our conclusion would be, yes, the, 
because of the pigeonhole principle by the pigeonhole principle F is not one to one. So at least two cards will be of the same denomination. Cool, cool? All right. So now let's look at this next one. Let's say the set T is equal to um, the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And suppose six integers are chosen from T. Must there be two integers whose sum is 11? Oh, sorry, folks. I've got a typo on this one. Um, I think I fixed it on your handout. But we're going to add comma 10. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are part of the set T. We're picking six integers from T. And we want to see, must there be two integers whose sum is 11 and why? So the pigeons would be the integers selected from T, whatever they are. These are our pigeons. And we don't know what they are, so let's just say T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, and T6. And then the pigeonholes would be how we can partition the set where we choose two integers where the sum is 11. So let's take a look at T. Um, if we partitioned T and looked at the set of the partitions that, that we could do a partition of, well, instead of making it look so complicated, let's just think of the different ways we could get a sum of 11. So if we chose 1 and 10, we just agree that 1 and 10 have a sum of 11. And going there, we've got, let's try 2 and 9. 3 and 8, 4 and 7, any other ways, 5 and 6. So there are five different ways we can get a sum of 11 without going back and, you know, picking, repicking them. So here are and this, of course, all of the all of these sets combined give us T. All right, so T is equal to the partitions of all these sets because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten are in all the sets. So let's call this function P. Right, and we can say that P of TI equals the subsets which contain TI and these subsets we'll just list out. So we had one and ten. 2 and 9, 3 and 8, 4 and 7, 5 and 6. And these are the five subsets. And the partition of T, pigeonholes. 
All right. If you take a look at this one, there are more pigeons than pigeon holes, right? We have more pigeons than pigeon holes. So, yes. So yes, since there are less subsets that partition T, then there are integers in the domain. Cool, cool? Okay, take a look at something else. Now let's say that you've got six pairs of similar looking boots thrown together in a pile. How many boots, so this is a little different, it's not asking if it has to happen, it's asking how many boots do you have to pick to be absolutely sure of getting a matched pair. Let's say you had to give this answer, if you didn't pick the correct answer, you were just going to be you know, thrown in a dungeon or something. So here, if you think about it, you've got 12 individual boots, right? We're not trying to match all the pairs. We just want to figure out how many boots we need to keep drawing without replacement, you know, and getting one match. So if you think about it, you could pick two boots and still get you could get a match, right, if you got lucky, but you might have two different boots. Three boots. Yes, again, you might get a match, but not necessarily. There are six boots that we could draw that would be different boots, right? If we were very unlucky. <laughs> so the maximum number of boots using this pigeonhole, you know, property that must be chosen to be sure, right? Or must be picked to be sure of getting a matched pair would have to be seven, right? Because if you were unlucky enough to pick six that were all different boots, since we started with six pairs of boots, once you got to that seventh boot, it would have to match one of them. Okay, so that was that was easy enough. What's so easy? It's hard, right? <laughs> All right. So now decimals, right? So if you think about repeating, so if you recall, a rational number is a number that can be written in integer over integer form, and and so. Um, basically repeat decimals um, that either terminate or repeat are rational numbers. So the way to think about something like this is to think about the potential number of remainders. So with something like this, if we think about, you know, let A over B equal to 683 over 1492. So, of course, from that, A would be 683, and B would be 1492. So, if we were to let 
R0 equal to A, where these R's are standing for remainders. So R1 and R2 all the way down to however many remainders, right? Be the successive remainders obtained in the long division of A over B. Now, we know from the quotient remainder theorem that each remainder must be between zero, so if you get a remainder of zero, it terminates, and b minus one. So in our case, in our case, um, each remainder is between zero and, whoops, sorry, this is 1493. So B minus one, therefore, would be 14. 92. So, 1492 is the maximum length of the repeating section. Now that doesn't tell us what the repeating section is, of course. So if you think about, say, one third, right? Well, one third is equal to, you know, one divided by three. And if you added zeros along to here, you find your repeating pattern pretty quickly. But that theorem tells us that between zero, you know, zero and three, or zero and three minus one, which is two, is what each remainder would be between. Ri between zero and two. So in this case, right, when we, each time we're gonna get a remainder of one. So one is the R zero we were talking about. It's also R one, R two, R three. So in this case, the repeating pattern occurs, um, it's just after one, okay? So there's one decimal or one character in the repeating section, all right? So, okay, generalize pigeonhole principle. So for any function f from a finite set x with n elements to a finite set y with m elements, and for any positive integer k, if k times m is less than n, then there is some y that belongs to y, so some lowercase y that belongs to the set y such that y is the image of at least k 
plus 1 distinct elements of x. So we're going to actually look at this problem in example 5 a couple different ways to show you a di couple different options of solving this problem. So a programmer writes 500 lines of computer code in 17 days. Must there have been at least one day when the programmer wrote 30 or more lines of code? And why? So let's take a look. What are the pigeons? Beautiful. The pigeons, in this case, the pigeons are the lines of code, right? And there's 500 lines. And the pigeon holes are the number of days, right? Are the days? So what do we look at? It's, it's saying here, is there a day when the programmer had to write 30 or more lines of code, right? 30 or more lines of code. So what we're looking at is this K times M business, is it less than N? So identifying that N is the 500 lines of code, right? And K plus one would be 30, right? Because we're talking about at least 30 lines of code. So here, K would be equal to 29. And then M is the 17 days. So, all right, we want to look at this K times M. Is that less than N, right? So K So plugging in 29 for K and then 17 for M and then finding out is this less than N, which was 500, well, it turns out that 29 times 17 is 493. And it is true that 493 is less than 500, right? So the generalized pigeonhole principle Actually, we should probably say by the generalized pigeonhole principle. There was at least one day when the programmer wrote 30 or more lines of code. Cool, cool? Okay, so now Sometimes you might want to look at, say, the contrapositive form and um, take a look at a different way to solve the problem. So for any function f from a finite set x with n elements to a finite set y with m elements, and for any positive integer k, if for each y, which is an element of y, F inverse at Y has at most K elements, then the set X has at most K times M 
elements. In other words, n would have to be less than or equal to k times m. So same problem, what we would do is we would suppose that there were no days in which 30 or more lines of code were written. So then at most, twenty nine lines of code would be written on any one day, right? And let we'll say of of the seventeen days. So this would imply that the total number of lines of code is 29, that would be our K, times 17 is the M, which is 493. But this contradicts the fact that there's 500 lines of code. So, hence, on at least one day, thirty or more lines of code were written. All right, cool, cool. Okay, so have a, I hope you're having a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you're watching this show. And if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe. Bye.